Good morning. It's Tuesday, September 1st, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 201, and my name is Chris. I am not in the studio right now. I'm actually reviewing something for the show. In fact, I'm standing next to a river. You don't believe me? I'll throw something in it. I promise that wasn't the soundboard. I'm also staring at a bald eagle with the sun in my face. It's it's freaking majestic over here. But you might wonder, why am I here on Tech Talk today? Well, uh, a few months ago, many of you doubters in the audience heard of the pop-up tent. Now, I know what you think. Chris, a pop-up tent, it's impossible. It can't happen. You need poles, you need stakes. And uh, it, was a, it was a crowdfunding project, and I said, no, I believe in the pop-up tent. I, I believe. And so I, I backed a four-person pop-up tent. This is months ago. My wife had written off, assumed I had l- wasted money. I never got a shipping trackman. It comes from some place called the UK. That doesn't even sound like a real place. So I had no idea if this thing was ever going to show up. But a couple of days ago, on my front porch, a rather large box showed up. In this box is a highly compressed four-person tent that once you unzip the wrapper and fling it into the air, poof, It's supposed to pop up into a giant four-person tent. No more setup required. Well, I decided to test this Kickstarter of the week. I backed it on the show, and now I will test it on the show. So in front of this frickin' bald eagle, and next to this river, I popped up a tent. But now I'm going to go back to the studio and give you my review. All right, so we'll get into the uh, tent in a little bit. I'll crawl into the tent, and I'll tell you how it went. And uh, yes, I did say it was September. Why? Because actually I was planning my road trip, and I was looking at my calendar for September, and so I said it was September. I know, it's very strange. I'm, a ma- I'm an odd person, but I was recording a show from a camp. Come on, give me a break. So before we get into the tent, let's get into today's news. Let's bring in the Mumble Room. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hello. 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 Greetings. Hey, guys. So uh, you guys probably remember it was uh, back in, uh, what was it? We just, oh, yeah, episode 179 of Tech Talk today, which was uh, June 5th, 2015. Uh, I grabbed the pop-up tent. We found it on Kickstarter, and I'm going to get into that more. We're going to give you a follow-up on that, and it turns out to be a fairly high-tech tent. It's got LED lights and a solar option, and it's pretty cool. But first, we got to talk about some of the crazy security news going on today. It's a bad day for Macs. Holy crap. So start. let's start with the zero-day bug and fully patched versions of Mac OS X that's actually already being exploited in the wild to some degree. Now, as ours reported last week, And now we're seeing some actual movement on it. This privilege escalation bug stems from a new error logging feature that Apple added to Mac OS 10.10. Developers didn't use standard safeguards involving additions to the OS 10 dynamic link DYLD. I'm sorry, I don't actually know what that is. A failure that lets attackers open or create files with root privileges. Uh Uh-oh. On Monday, researchers from the anti-malware firm Malwarebytes said a new malicious installer is exploiting the vulnerability to to serendipitously. Boy, that's... Uh huh. In fact, Max with several types of adware, including a search, a V search, a variant of uh, uh, something we've seen before, Mac Keeper junkware, and others. You know, traditional stuff that you used to see on Windows boxes. Here's the difference, though. To get this to actually work, you've got to get the Mac user to download the installer, the .package file, not, which is not even a super common way to install applications on the Mac to begin with, especially now that the Mac App Store is more prominent. And then you've got to get them to run it, and then you've got to get them to potentially uh, allow it to bypass the signature-requiring functionality of Mac OS X, which means they probably have to right-click on it and open the file. And then they have to supply their administrative password or their own user password. There's a lot of steps to get the user to execute this. Now, of course... All it takes is chaining another vulnerability that bypasses that for some reason. But until Apple fixes the bug, Mac users don't actually have any great options. There's no, there's no patch. The community has created a patch Last called... Last year, a small Chinese startup called One Plus <laughs> surprised everyone. With the oh, hi there. Of hi there. Thank you. Thank you. One Thank you. One, which became a huge success, uh-huh. selling over 1.5 million units. Thank you. The so uh, those of you who watch live uh, happen to know that... Um, you know what? I'm not even, you know even going to cover that story now. I'm going to delete that story. From the round, I'm just going to delete it from the lineup right now. So that w- what you just heard there was uh, International Business Times, and uh, they're a bunch of bastards. What they like to do is they'll play a vid, they just auto play a flash video, not even related to the story. So I had a story up there about how MIT researchers have essentially compromised the Tor network with like 88 percent success rate, and uh, they have a couple of su- they have a couple of fixes, and the Tor guys are kind of doubtful. That's interesting. So I thought we'd talk about it here on the show. International Business Times though would like to auto play you a video about the One Plus Two. Not related to Tor at all. And what they also like to do, so that way they get extra views, is they like to automatically refresh the page in the background from time to time. And of course, every time the page loads, 
that video auto plays. So what we're going to do is we're going to ban International Business Times from the show from now on. No more stories from International Business Times. Sorry, guys. You're done because you're a bunch of dicks. So anyways, back to this story. There is a community patch out there called Esser. You can do it right now. You can apply this to fix this bug on your Mac. I wouldn't do that. A lot of people don't think it's a good idea. Security researchers are not actually sure it's a good idea. It's never probably a great idea to use a third-party patch to patch your operating system, especially Mac OS X. While we're on the topic of Mac vulnerabilities, this one is nasty. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Thunder Strike, but you're probably familiar with Thunderbolt, the connectivity technology that a lot of Macs have. It's basically PCI Express on a wire. It's pretty slick, right? You get a, an external device, you plug in over Thunderbolt, and that thing's on the PCI Express bus like a card in your machine, like a, like a PCI Express slot. That's neat. You can do video cards, you can do massive storage arrays, but guess what? Devices on the PCI Express bus have a lot of extra privileges. They're, they're wired right into the infrastructure, and they can get access to things that USB devices or external peripherals could never even dream of, things the operating system can't get access to. These devices get access to. And that is where Thunderstrike came along. Thunderstrike was essentially the ability to infect Max when you hook up a Thunderbolt device, and it could spread to every Thunderbolt device you spread it, you move it to. And once you infect a Mac, that Mac could then infect other Thunderbolt devices, and it's essentially spreading a malware, firmware malware, via sneaker net, like old school sneaker net, pretty neat. But very limited, requires physical access, not likely to go far. Wouldn't it be slick if you could do it over the network? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm introducing you to Thunderstrike 2. Yeah, woohoo, everybody. Check it out from uh, a video from, I believe, the author here that essentially gives you all the great details. And uh, I think you're going to see more after Black Hat comes out. Thunderstrike 2 starts with a local root privilege exploit that can load a kernel module to give it access to raw memory. On some systems, it can immediately unlock and rewrite the motherboard boot flash. On others, it needs to hook the S3 resume script and wait for a sleep event. It can also search the PCIe bus for removable Thunderbolt devices and write itself into their option ROMs. This is an improvement over Thunderstrike 1, which required physical access to the attack a machine. Like the original, Thunderstrike 2's proof of concept is not very stealthy, so when the system reboots, the logo is displayed and various hooks are inserted into the running EFI firmware. Now that's a pretty big deal. I, I didn't realize this until I'd watched this video, that when Thunderstrike is infecting the Mac, um, <laughs> it puts a full screen Thunderstrike logo up on the screen. Like it's, it's, it's ASCII, but it's a big old, like, there's no missing that if you're watching your Mac boot up. Now, obviously, they can make that silent, so that, but that does make it less uh, um, ominous, I guess. When the infected adapter is connected to a fresh laptop during a system boot, the option ROM is executed by EFI firmware before the kernel is started. The option ROM can't directly write to the flash, so instead it hooks the S3 resume script that will be executed when the system comes out of a sleep mode. We can identify when the system has entered the S3 suspend a RAM sleep by waiting for the fans to shut down. The vulnerability is that the flash protection bits are reset when coming out of this mode, giving the attack a window of time to write Thunderstrike 2 into the motherboard boot flash. Once installed in the boot flash, it is very difficult to remove, since it controls the system from the very first instruction executed upon booting. This includes the keys for updating the firmware. Reinstalling OS X won't remove it. Replacing the hard drive won't remove it. Even swap- Did you catch that? Reinstalling the OS, replacing the hard drive doesn't remove it. It's in the boot ROM. Swapping to a new laptop has the possibility of reinfection from shared Thunderbolt devices. Again, this proof of concept isn't very stealthy. So when the system reboots, we'll see the Thunderstrike logo. A weaponized version could use virtualization or SMM to hide from attempts to detect it. Thunderstrike 2 also watches for new Thunderbolt devices to be attached and can write itself to a clean adapter when it detects the PCIe hot plug event. This hardware transmission vector allows it to potentially cross mm. air gap security measures. Mm. Thunderstrike 2's proof of concept demonstrates the entire cycle of a software exploit that can write to the motherboard boot flash, which then can infect Thunderbolt option ROMs, which can hook the S3 resume script or SMM and repeat the installation into the motherboard boot flash chips on new machines. That seems like a pretty big deal now that they've been able to deliver via software, which means they could probably deliver it over the network. So it's a bad week for Mac security, and I'm not quite sure what Apple will do here. Uh, they're pretty good about issuing updates and fixes, but I still think that Apple doesn't quite have the culture necessary to really tackle these kind of problems from a big perspective. UEFI is just not super great from a security perspective, and Apple has key, has, 
has continues to run into problems like this. That like they at one point at, 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 in one respect, Apple's all about security. You know, uh, like the way Touch ID is designed is 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 very clever. Right, having the authentication token being stored actually in the CPU, never actually giving the a, a credentials themselves to the operating system, but authorizing it at a CPU level and then giving a yes/no authorization back to the host OS. That's brilliant, right? That's nice and secure because then you don't get the access to those credentials when you compromise the OS. Actually, makes fingerprint ID a nice, secure implementation. Then you go to things like this, though, where uh, when you get physical access to Macs, you can just own them via a Thunderbolt device. It's, it's, there's a wide range of security and implementations, and Apple seems to be focused in some areas and really unfocused in other areas. And it also seems to depend on how much priority they give with their products, and the Mac just isn't as much of a priority to them. You know, it's only like a $30 billion business, so <laughs> they got other things to worry about. <clears throat> All right. What's crazy about this, though, is that like Mac's popularity has kept going up and up, and now we're seeing the yeah. price of that. Right. Is that more people are focusing it on it and cracking their code and things like that? And I wouldn't be surprised because the FBI has been like, "Hey, Apple, we want you not to use encryption. We want to be able to get into your phones." Mm -hmm. And now they have a way to get into their ecosystem. With oh this. yeah, oh, if yeah. they're not already using it, right? And we That's don't know. That's the thing that I often think when we hear about these kind of exploits is, oh, I bet there's some agency in some state somewhere in the world that already figured this out and has already been using it, and now we just caught up, the, us general public, you know, we just caught up to it. And uh, now those agencies are going, ah, dang it, now we got to find another backdoor. You know, that's totally what they're doing. Uh, all right, so let's shift gears back to uh, the uh, the Cinch tent, uh, the Cinch pop up tent. It is a, I got the four person variant. I I, I grabbed it right after uh, episode one seventy nine of Tech Talk today. We found it on Kickstarter because we often do a Kickstarter of the week here on the show, and I was pretty impressed with the concept. The idea is you can get a two, three, or four man tent. Uh, you can get a solar power pack to sit on the top of it. The stakes have LED lights in it, which looks super cool. Uh, the, it has light reflective uh, guidelines, or I guess they call them guy lines, on the, and it actually does work. I, I mean, I, I'm, all this is actually legit from my experience. And so I went over and I pre-ordered. That's what they have it available now is a pre-order for the uh, 2000 for the for the I guess they call it the 2015 model, and I got the four person edition. All very fancy. I ordered it in June, and then I had to sit around and wait for quite a while. And I didn't really know when it was going to show up. I didn't really get any information about it. Uh, but uh, I got to my location to camp. I took it out of the packaging. Now, I'd already tried this once before, before I went out. I took it out of the packaging, and I kind of just mess it around. You just kind of mess with it a little bit, and it really does. It just kind of springs to life. And once it's up, it turns out, well, it kind of like a tent. Once the tent is set up and you get it futz with it a little bit and get it placed, the first thing that strikes you about it is, uh, well, it just kind of looks like a tent. It doesn't look like a pop-up tent. It just looks like a boring old tent. Um, kind of a cool-shaped tent, and it has doors on both sides, which is nice. Big entrance ways that are covered, um, and then there's an inner wall and an outer wall like you'd expect on a tent, and so there's two doors on the out on each side to get in and out, and uh, so it kind of creates, in a sense, a uh, closed-off porch area that you could pretty much stand in and uh, spread your arms out and you're in a there's an outer wall and an inner wall oh man I'm sitting here recording this for you guys and I just watched a fish I guess a salmon I don't know what the hell it is spawning I don't know I just watched some big ass fish jump out of the river right in front of me uh, anyways uh, and so then you get to the inner inner wall and there's another zipper and there's also uh, windows on each side of it that have an outer zipper and an inner zipper and it ends up creating a really, really good moisture barrier, having that inner and outer wall. Like you'd expect, it works extremely well. Stuff that we left in the porch area got a little wet. Stuff we left out outside got very wet. Stuff on the inside, the in on, with the inner wall, not wet at all. I had my phone like in the built-in pockets, slipped in the side of the tent. No, no moisture on my phone at all. No problem. Stayed nice and warm in there. Although it's not very cold out here, it's a pretty nice day already. It's what time is it right now as I'm recording this? It's uh, <clears throat> six in the morning. <laughs> it's already sunny and, and nice out. So it's not like uh, super cold conditions, but you get in there and it's really comfortable. It, there was slight wind last night, didn't feel any of that. It felt very sturdy. In fact, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I chose not to even use the stakes because it's not that windy and I got stuff inside the tent. I didn't even have to put any stakes down. So that's pretty dope. I mean, you just pop the thing up. It, the, the ends of it do kind of stick up a little bit. Like there's definitely, like if you want to look really good, you're gonna want to put 
stakes down but once you're in it for a couple of hours it just kind of sits there perfectly like you wouldn't even know it's not staked down right now um not 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 an ideal use obviously you don't want to uh you don't want to uh you know have your tent blow away but uh as far as like could i just really pop up a tent and sleep in it it absolutely accomplished that today so that's pretty cool now the the, the real challenge was uh um, putting it back together now if here's a here's a basic rule I would follow with a pop-up tent if you are like if you have one of these visors for your vehicle that uh, you put in the windshield that, that blocks the Sun and it's like one of those twisty foldy ones not like the cardboard ones but like the cloth ones that you fold into like a little circle and if you if you can do that in like two seconds if you're like boom, 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 and you can put it away then you're gonna be fine with a pop-up tent um, if if those are uh, one of life's greatest challenges for you, then a pop-up tent is also going to be one of life's greatest challenges for you. Um, I, I'll tell you what. The first cup. So it, the, here's 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 my general rule of thumb. Uh, get get spousal approval if you're not super great at these kinds of things, because it's a lot easier, at least with the four-person tent, to actually fold it with two people. Their instructions kind of don't really make sense if you are not. If you're a person that's more visual, because the drawings are kind of a little cryptic, I would really love to see if I could have one recommendation to the cinch folks. It would be maybe, and maybe they have this. I didn't look. I should have probably, but I don't. I didn't see it on their website. I did check there. Uh, a YouTube video showing how to fold the four-person tent and the two-person tent, etc. Because essentially, you fold it together, and then you make a figure eight, and you fold that, and you fold that. So if you have spousal approval and you have somebody that'll help you do it, you're you're golden. Because usually, two people can figure it out, no problem. If you're doing it by yourself, it's a little trickier. Uh, or if you're there with a camping buddy, he'll do it with that. That's that's the route I went. That worked really great. Now, when I decided to fold it down in the morning when we were leaving, I was pretty hungry. I didn't really have a lot of time. So I just kind of like got it mostly folded. I tried to get it all the way down, but I was just like, I want to get out of here. I want to go eat. So I just carried it out, and it's in the back of my truck. Now, it's in the back of my truck. It's not a big deal. I can now take it out and fold it down again. But it's kind of neat to just be able to pop it up. Folding it back down is kind of as challenging as you might expect, but not not super, super bad if you have time and maybe a little help. I, I say overall, if you're looking for like a quick, easy way to go camping, it's nice. It's high tech. I I, uh, I didn't, let's see, do I have any, uh, let's see if I have any pictures here of the, uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, here, let me see. This is, so you can check out, uh, it's uh, cinchpopuptents.co.uk for their website. And uh, they have a whole bunch of info on their site about it. And it's pretty neat. Uh, they're they're out of UK. The ten, the uh, tents are made in uh, China. You can get the whole kit with the LED lanterns and torches and four LED tent pegs, and twenty light reflective uh, guy lines and two canopies and poles. I actually decided not to get the solar kit. Um, I didn't really feel the need to get the solar kit to be honest with you, but uh, you can get it. And uh, I, for me, I was pretty happy with the size of the four person tent. And they have different they have different tents in different sizes. Yeah. Yeah, JB Hawk of Truth has narrowed down where I went. You're pretty close, said JB Hawk of Truth. You're pretty close. And uh, you can check out some cool pictures. There's some really neat pictures on their website. And uh, they do have a YouTube page, so maybe I should check to see if they have a folding thing. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, and they show you some of the lighting. Really cool tent, you guys. It felt pretty high. It felt like a pretty high-tech way to camp. The inside is really well, is spacious. The floor, the matting is sort of a tarp base, so I was a little worried it might be a little delicate, but I didn't have any problems, and we had some rocks underneath us. And uh, nice pockets for uh, holding everything. Hooks built in for your lanterns. It's really cool. So if you want a nice, easy way to go out and go camping, I recommend it. And uh, I uh, put it up for the kids to play with, too. And it had major kid approval. So uh, they can't wait to take it out. We'll be going out uh, in the future with them. So there you go. That's the Cinch Pop-Up Tent, and I'll have links to that in the show notes. It's a pretty fun way to go out and camp to make it nice and quick. Hey, so we have a few things coming up in uh, the near future. Uh, Linux Unplugged is going to be live if everything goes as planned at um, LinuxCon. LinuxCon is going to be August. We're going to be there August 17th and 18th. It goes on a little bit more than that. And it's going to be in Seattle, our neck of the woods. So I think we're going to do some sort of meetup. So uh, I haven't scheduled anything yet. I'm kind of trying to get the lay of the land. But you can go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting if you're going to be at LinuxCon August 17th through the 19th. And we're going to be there Monday and Tuesday. So that's the 17th and 18th. And my plan is, I'll, if everything can work out, to do Unplugged Live from LinuxCon. Because uh, Unplugged is on Tuesday. It'd be really cool. So meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting is where we'll have all of the details as we get that kind of stuff worked out. I know it's a little late, but I'd love to see you there. It's really cool to meet up with you guys. And uh, we have a bunch of cool stuff planned uh, down the road, quite literally. Uh, maybe we'll have a chance to have a meetup in your area, too. So it's not a bad idea to hit that meetup page for future stuff down the road. And uh, you can find out more about uh, LinuxCon by going to events.linuxfoundation.org. 
www.ghostbusters.org. We could use your support. We're trying to get more support staff, and we want to do it with the support of our community. You can go to patreon.com slash today to help us accomplish that initiative. The goal here is to expand the support staff to help us accomplish a little more and take a little bit of the burden off. So that way we have sustainable workloads for our hosts. You know, I don't want to burn out the hosts and get them all worn out. And so we want to help them with that. We also have some goals in-house to make availability, to keep things running if I have to take a medical break and things like that. And the goal here really is to be able to accomplish that without having to lean on sponsors. Because then you start to get to a point that gets a little uncomfortable if negotiations ever get rough. We like to have a really nice, friendly relationship where we can say, okay, thank you, but no thank you. And that flexibility is made possible because we've diversified our funding and, and we're trying to get more of it to come from the community because that way, really, our responsibility then is to the community. I, I like the idea of, of the bulk of the funding for the really core stuff coming from the community because to me, that makes the community the boss. So that means when we're sitting down to create content, we're thinking what's going to make those people the happiest, not what's going to make the sponsor the happiest. And even though we, we, we swear we never do that, it's hard not to at least, when you're forming the show, think how do we make this appealing to a sponsor so that way we can make enough revenue to keep the show going. And it's kind of this like line you have to walk. And so far, I mean, we've, we've been doing it for a long time, and I'm pretty happy with where we're at. And I think the reason I am is because we've leveraged things like community funding for a long time in different forms. Now, Patreon is allowing us to do it in a way that's very structured. We can give rewards. Like we, put out, we put out videos and things like that for our patrons. And that system has really kind of allowed us to codify this idea into something that's really focused now. And I really like your support. Patreon.com slash today. We're at 562. I think, I don't know, my rough guess is when we get around 600, we start looking at maybe bringing people on. I'm not quite sure what that'll look like. It'll depend on the levels of people pledging and whatnot. And uh, I would really appreciate your support in this effort. Patreon.com slash today. Thanks, everybody. Tech Talk Today will be back tomorrow and every day this week. As far as I know, there could be a couple of gotchas. Uh, first could be tomorrow, actually. Kind of depends on our scheduling, but uh, I'm planning to go down and see my buddy Chase, co-host of Unfilter, at his place of work, the local ABC affiliate. They, there is a, uh, just a world-class facility down there. They call it, it used to be called Fisher Plaza. I, I, I think it's called Como Plaza now. And it is, it's, it's really neat. It's really something. And they're, they're in the transition right now from their old classic news set, news set, to a new news set. And uh, it's just a really neat time to go down there. Depending on that, I may not be able to make it to, to, uh, for Tech Talk Live. I will, I'm going to see if I can bring my recorder, though, and see if I can get a few things if that happens. Uh, and then Friday, we may or may not be having some, peep, some peeps in studio to do some recording. So all scheduling changes are always as fast as we can updated on the calendar, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. If there was a story you wanted to see covered, a topic, a Kickstarter of the week, an end of show clip, you can uh, submit that to techtalktoday.reddit.com techtalktoday.reddit.com. I really do appreciate that. Now, last week, we'd gotten on the topic of speech recognition because it was Windows 10 and Cortana, and I had a chance to play with Cortana, actually, this weekend, and it still made me think about the good old days when speech recognition was once again new and once again exciting. So this will be, I think, at least for a little while, our last end of show clip on the topic, but this is the authority. It's nuance, and you can talk like a pirate. See you back here tomorrow, everybody. We once lived a pirate named Blackbeard. He was not nice. Arr. Delete not nice. The most ruthless pirate ever. Arr. He had a hook for a hand and one eye. Scratch that. He had an egg beater for a hand and no eyes. Arr. Blackbeard stole gold, but worse, he stole children. Arr. Arr. Delete, delete! Click save. Dragon speech recognition software. Bring your ideas to life by talking, not typing.